Day 13 of the search for the three Israeli teenagers as the IDF arrests 17 Palestinians overnight and Israeli warplanes pound the Gaza Strip in retaliation for rocket fire. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki rejects calls to form a unified government as dozens are killed in a strike reportedly carried out by the Syrian Air Force. And Libyans go to the polls to elect a new national parliament despite the worst violence in the country since 2011. Thank you for joining us here at the program. We begin in Israel as the Israeli Defense Force Operation Brothers Keeper continues for a 13th day after three Israeli teenagers were allegedly kidnapped in the West Bank. Well, throughout the operation, the Israeli security forces have rounded up hundreds of Palestinians and searched entire towns as they work to find any leads as to the teens' whereabouts. And today, the Israeli Security Cabinet is meeting once again to discuss the ongoing situation. Well, we're now joined by senior Middle Eastern analyst Ali Wakid. Ali, thanks for joining us Thank again you. here. Uh, First of all, what's the general update on the situation now across the West Bank with the security operation? Well, from the uh, military point of view, the uh, Israeli operation was uh, reduced. Uh, the dimension of the operation, the rhythm of the operation, the number of persons who are uh, arrested, the number of uh, homes, houses, Hamas officers, bureaus that are uh, invaded are uh, going uh, uh, significantly uh, down. Uh, the most, uh, the last update was uh, came from Gaza a couple of hours ago in a rally of uh, Hamas with the participation of thousands of Hamas uh, militants and uh, sympathizers, where the uh, deputy uh, chairman of the Palestinian Legislative uh, Council, Ahmad uh, Baha, uh, said that Hamas will retaliate against the Israeli campaign uh, in the uh, West Bank and in Gaza Strip. And he said that Hamas didn't, Hamas or any other organization, did not yet uh, take responsibility for the kidnapping, but he says that this is a very blessed operation. This is an operation that Hamas support, Hamas uh, back up, and Hamas think that these kind of operations are the key uh, to release and to liberate the prisoners, meaning that the uh, the Israeli message didn't yet, uh, was not yet absorbed and accepted and understood by uh, by uh, Hamas. And according to uh, the Palestinian uh, sources, uh, they don't feel that Hamas sells Hamas second, third class uh, militants uh, stop totally and fully uh, their activity because because of the uh, IDF operation. Well, we'll come back to you again, Ali, in a bit. Also want to introduce Noam Badin, who's joining us in the studio here, uh, director of the State Road Media Center. We'll come back to you in a short while here. But now, moving on, as Operation Brothers Keeper continues to roll, a mysterious case emerged of two Hamas activists from Hebron, wanted by the IDF, who seemed to have vanished off the face of the earth right around the time that the teens disappeared. Y24 News obtained an interview with their families, and Maxime Perez brings us the story. For Israel, tracking down Hamas in the West Bank is closely linked to the search operation that aims to recover the three Israeli teens believed abducted on June 12th. So far, over 350 Palestinians have been arrested in the operation, most of them members of the Islamist movement. Others are still on the run. Two of the names on the suspect list drew the attention of the intelligence services. Two Palestinians who haven't shown any sign of life since the night of the teens' disappearance. One of them, Musa, comes from a powerful family of Hebron, linked to Hamas. Within 10 days, all his brothers have been detained. The soldiers came several times to search his house, as shown in this footage shot by the Palestinian television. On location, our team wasn't welcomed. We're heading to the second suspect's house in another neighborhood of Hebron. For almost two weeks now, the family hadn't heard from Ahmed, 25, a well-known Hamas militant. In front of the camera, his father shares his story. On Thursday, my son and I went to a wedding at 8 p.m. It was the wedding of a cousin. Around 10 p.m. I asked where Ahmed is, and I was told he went back home. So we went to sleep. On Friday morning, the day after, it was impossible to find him. In the 1990s, Ahmed's father spent 22 months in an Israeli prison. In 2005, one of his sons was killed in a confrontation with the army. He was building explosive devices for Hamas. That seems to be not enough to convince him that his son Ahmed followed in his brother's footsteps. We don't know what happened to him, but this kidnapping story makes no sense. I don't believe any of it. And another piece of evidence. 
In Gaza, sources close to Hamas have told us the two suspects, whose relatives received us, aren't among the Palestinians arrested so far in the West Bank. Whether he is arrested by his soldiers or becomes a military, it is the Israelis fault anyway. It is now in God's hands. I can only pray in the meantime. It is of course impossible to affirm at this point the two men have indeed kidnapped Eyal, Naftali and Gilad. But the evidence seems to indicate they are more than mere fugitives. With Ali Wakid, our senior Middle East analyst. Uh, Ali, what's your response to this piece that we just saw now? Well, the, as for the uh, uh, what the father uh, said, it was very uh, rhetoric, very uh, uh, expected. Uh, he said what many Palestinians who are not directly involved in the uh, operation or in the uh, uh, political uh, environment, they are raising questions about whether there was really a kidnapping or there was not really a kidnapping. And this is not only a uh, um, psychological uh, battle against uh, Israel. There are many sections of the Palestinian people who do believe that this is an invented Zionist Israeli uh, question. Now it is very uh, interesting that there was the kidnapping a couple of hours before the kidnapping. This very senior uh, militant of Hamas disappeared uh, from his home with his uh, colleague uh, Kawasme. Nobody know in the uh, military wing of Hamas, close sources, close senior members of the mili military wing of Hamas in Gaza uh, deny any knowledge or any information about where they are, uh, these uh, two. And and the suspensions that are suspicious about whether Hamas is behind or not, when it comes to see why these two guys disappeared very closely to the operation, uh, really allow us to believe maybe uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu have more than uh, um, have some evidence when he is pointing and accusing Hamas for being behind uh, this operation. Ali, can you speculate if Hamas were responsible for this, why would they not come out? And, and admit it now. There is the reconciliation uh, process. There is uh, Israeli uh, measures uh, to diminish the suffering, to diminish uh, 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 uh to diminish the, the possibility or, or actually to uh, give the, the Palestinians more freedom of maneuver, more freedom to move. A, a couple of days before the uh, the kidnapping, we heard that the Israeli authorities allowed 5,000 more Palestinians to come and work into uh, into Israel. Hamas didn't want to confront this public opinion that was very satisfied with the uh, reconciliation and very satisfied with the Israeli uh, uh, measures that relatively uh, diminished their uh, their suffering. On the, uh, on the other hand, Hamas is facing huge pressure from from their leaders in the Israeli jail to do an act, to do something in order to uh, uh, to try to release them. When Hamas uh, uh, concluded the uh, Shalit deal with Israel, many Hamas leaders who remained in uh, in jail that Israel refused to uh, uh, to put them in the in the list of those who can be uh, released, uh, kept their pressure over the leadership of the movement to get released. Just a small story: you know that Ibrahim Hamid, the leader of Hamas military wing in uh, um, in the West Bank is a neighbor of Khaled Mash'al family in the village of, of Yabrud near uh, Ramallah. And, and the people say that the mother of this is putting pressure over the mother of that one, that your son, Khaled Mash'al, should do more in order to get my son Ibrahim released. So Hamas didn't have uh, much choice, and Hamas is trying to hint to the Iranians, we are ready to be back in this camp, in this camp that is against Israel, against the United States. Hamas understood this war, that the war in Syria Syria is most probably uh, uh, ended, and uh, for the sake of Bashar Assad and the Syrian uh, regime, Hamas was part of the, of the Syrian opposition. Hamas was accused to support the uh, Syrian rebels, and now it is trying to reopen the channels with of Iran. The, of the greater uh, regional narrative. Again, thank you very much, senior Middle East analyst Ali Wakin. And moving on now as the Israeli Defense Force Operation Brothers Keeper continues in the West Bank, while the focus of the current conflict between Israel and Hamas seems to be shifting to the Gaza Strip and the surrounding areas. Well, overnight, the Israeli Air Force struck targets in Gaza following yet another barrage of rockets fired into Israel on Tuesday. I-24 News reporter Shai ben Ari has the story. As Operation Brothers Keeper in the West Bank gradually loses steam, the situation in the Gaza Strip and in the Israeli communities surrounding it keeps heating up. Tuesday night, the Israeli Air Force attacked seven targets inside Gaza, with the IDF saying these included five rocket launching sites, a weapons manufacturing facility, and another site labeled only as a, quote, center of terror activity, unquote. 
A Palestinian government official said the strikes had injured two Palestinian Navy police officers, adding that they were in stable condition. Palestinian media claimed the strikes hit three military bases, a police station, a poultry farm, and other open areas. I was in my room and I heard the sound of an airplane. I was scared and suddenly the bombing of the farm blew out the windows of the room and I escaped. These latest Israeli airstrikes came in retaliation to more Palestinian rockets being fired at Israeli targets from Gaza Tuesday. One rocket hit a town in the Stot Negev area, causing minor damage to a building. Two others were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system, and another two landed in open areas not far from the city of Ashkelon. The IDF announced it held Hamas responsible for these attacks originating from areas under its control. In a separate incident, Palestinian medical sources said a young Palestinian girl was killed and three of her relatives injured when a rocket fired at Israel fell short and landed in the northern Gaza Strip. This latest round of exchanges between Hamas and IDF forces follows five separate Israeli strikes on Gaza last week, also in retaliation to Palestinian rocket fire. As Israel's conflict with Hamas continues, the residents of this area on both sides of the border will be hoping this escalation has already reached its peak. We now go live to Shai ben our correspondent, standing by near the Gaza border with Israel. Uh, Shai, now, as rocket fire has increased over southern communities in the last days, what's the latest update there this evening? Right, David, we're here live from the Israel-Gaza border. You might be able to see that's Gaza right there behind me. It has been a fairly tense day uh, here in Gaza following the Israeli strikes last night. Um, tense day here in the area, really, following the Israeli strikes in the Gaza Strip. But um, really, the, uh, the anticipation is for perhaps a further escalation following what we saw last night. Now, uh, that for, so far has not happened. Basically, uh, we are waiting perhaps for something to happen, but nothing has so far. And uh, really, the uh, Israeli Defense Minister, Moshe Yalon, commented on this uh, latest round of violence. He, interestingly, he chose to describe the, um, he chose to describe the uh, actions of Hamas as something of a drizzle, a, uh, a drizzle of rockets uh, landing on Israeli targets. Now, uh, interestingly, you can describe this perhaps as both dismissive and threatening. Uh, so nothing but a drizzle, according to the Israeli Defense Minister. David. Well, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Shai ben is standing by at the Gaza-Israel border. Well, now we are joined again in studio here by Noam Badin, who is uh, the director of the State Road Media Center here. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening and uh, being a patient guest here in studio as well. Uh, I have to at least mention the, the guest that you brought with you here today. Uh, this is a fragment of a Qassam rocket that was fired from the Gaza Strip uh, into the town of Stay Road in southern Israel. I, I believe it was in 2007, according to uh, the date written on the fin of the rocket here. Uh, right now, as things have begun to flare up again, uh, and I hate to say again, but this has definitely been a recurring theme uh, for residents in, in your area, how are you responding to this? And, and how is your media center? What are your activities like? I can say that overall, since the beginning of the operation, uh, Brothers Keeper, has, has been over 20 rockets missiles being fired from Gaza towards uh, Israel. It has been a more intense kind of situation, but overall, every couple of months, by living and experiencing the steroid rocket reality, we're always expecting uh, an escalation of rocket fire, more or less. I can say overall, to explain that ever since the end of Operation Pillar of Defense, since that point up until today, it's been over 270. In, uh, uh, to, to, well, the, the November 2012, oh, excuse actually. Excuse me, Castle Lead, 2008, right. 2012, yes. yes. So since that point, the end of this operation until today, it's been over 270 rockets and missiles being fired towards southern Israel. The hardest thing to get the experience across, because even here in Israel, the daily news broadcasts are mentioning how two of these Qassam rockets sell nearby Sderot or near Ashkelon, no injuries and no harm done, and to the weather report. And to explain to people, when you have 15 to 30 seconds to run for your life, every single time having a sarn going off, that's the experience that we try getting across to people what became very part of the daily routine life in this part of the region. Well, State Road has been one of the, uh, if you will, epicenters of the recent conflict, the recent era of rocket fire out of the Gaza Strip. Uh, you've lived in this town now for how long? Well, I personally lived for five years in Zderot, and, and I've been running the media center for the past eight years. Uh, well, now we're also joined by Iran Singer, and you're the uh, Middle East editor for IBA, uh, joining this conversation a bit. Uh, how do you see this 
this recent flare-up now from Gaza involving the Gaza Strip and, and a renewed rocket fire out of the Gaza Strip. Well, I really don't think that Hamas have uh, the interest right now to uh, open another front with Israel. What, what they have right now with Israel or with the Israeli army in the uh, West Bank is uh, is pretty big for uh, for their size, and and I don't think they want to open another front in Gaza. And um, another very important piece of information is the fact that we have been witnessing again Hamas police arresting um, local militias, which are not connected to Hamas, uh, which have been trying uh, to launch new rockets. So, whenever you call it Qassam rockets, what we see over here, um, we are making a mistake because Qassam, the rockets that are named Qassam are only for Hamas. The others are not. And, and it's very important for them because once you, you launch it, they want the credit. They need the credit for the for the sponsors. Okay, so for them, it, it, for us uh, Israelis, it doesn't matter whether it's coming from Hamas or others. But but for them, it is very crucial. And what they're trying to put right now to to make very uh, understood is the fact that they are doing the best they can. So they say, to put an end to the uh, to the. Um, uh, like uh, local uh, militias launching the rockets and not Hamas. Well, Noam, back to you for a minute here. As a resident of State Road, as you mentioned, this town has lived under rocket fire now for many years. How do the residents there deal with this, and, and uh, how, do they, how do they respond? How do they continue living in an area like this? I'll be honest. By living in Zderot for the past uh, five and dealing with it for the past eight years, half of my adult life, it's amazing seeing the shift of this town that's over a decade, by the way, this past October, this coming October, is going to be entering our 14th year being under rocket fire. Overall, the concept, I think, also to explain about Sderot. Sderot became one of the only towns in the 21st century where entire civilian population has been under rocket, fire, and threat for the past over a decade. According to the Sderot security officer, over 8,600 rockets have been, far, have been exploding actually into the town itself, into the Small surrounding town. area. Almost every single road, this is my experience moving to Sderot, was going to the security officer's office and seeing, seeing on the wall a map of Sderot with dots indicating where these rockets have exploded. And he, he described to me how seven years ago at the time he stopped putting dots on this map because you won't, you won't, you won't notice there's a there's a there's a uh, an actual map behind exactly the, behind there's the dots. actually a map over here meaning that every single road every single street every single community family and child has the experience of a rocket exploding nearby literally every single person so that's one hand you have this a very extreme kind of situation if you, call, if you want to call it post trauma quoting Dr. Adriana Katz who's the director of the mental health center, there is no post-trauma in Zderot. This is still very much traumatic, meaning it could be quiet for two, three weeks. Once you have that one siren go off, you go back to that first day you've experienced a rocket explode nearby. So that whole psychological impact, the whole psychological warfare has not really been presented or explained through media elements. And this became our challenge to try to express this very part of the daily routine of this human side of the story is not, that, that has not been getting too much of notice or media attention. Well, Noam Badin, uh, the director of the Steroid Media Center, thank you very much for your time and uh, for bringing us a, a piece of the war here. Thank you. Well, moving on now, Israeli President Shimon Peres arrived in Washington, D.C., where he's now meeting with U.S. President Barack Obama for the last time in office. While the West Bank kidnapping affair is expected to have topped the agenda, as well as the Iranian nuclear program, the war in Syria, and U.S.-Israel relations. Well, the Israeli request to release Jonathan Pollard, who's been jailed in the U.S. for espionage for decades, is expected to be in the background of the meeting, as Peres met with Pollard's wife several days before leaving to the U.S. Well, now we're joined on the phone by Chemi Shalev in Washington, D.C., the diplomatic correspondent for Haaretz newspaper. Well, thank you for joining us. Hi, how are you? Uh, doing fine here. Well, I want to ask you, the Israeli president is in the end of his term now. Is there any concrete substance to this, to this meeting, or is it mostly a, a ceremonial gesture at this point? Well, of course, we're very uh, curious to see what will happen uh, with uh, Paris. Uh, the request that Paris promised to make about concerning the release of Jonathan Pollard um, otherwise, I think it'll probably not have much of a substantive importance. There'll be a lot of discussion about the issues of the day. I'm sure that Mr. Paris will weigh in on the peace process, but mainly this is a sort of a ceremonial farewell tour. Um, um, the wife so appreciates Mr. Paris perhaps even more than they appreciate the Prime Minister and sort of project by the President. Those medals that uh, the president will be, uh, will be receiving tomorrow from Congress. 
Well, as we've been covering here our, in, in our special edition coverage here of the, of the three kidnapped teenagers in Israel, do you anticipate that that should be uh, perhaps headlining the meeting between these two? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure that it will be raised by the, the, by the president, uh, by both presidents, but I don't think it will headline the meeting. I don't see that uh, uh, President uh, Obama has much to contribute, and I'm not sure that President Perez supports uh, the, government, the, the government's position that this should mean the dismantling of the uh, Palestinian unity government. So I don't think that that will, uh, that will take a large part of the uh, meeting. I think that uh, President uh, Perez will try to probably propose to President Obama perhaps ways that he should, uh, that, that might be possible to renew the peace process. In any case, he will urge President Obama not to abandon the peace process. Well, thank you very much, Jaime Shalev. And now we go to the studio in Bethlehem here as we uh, talk to his correspondent here now as dozens of Palestinian prisoners have suspended their hunger strike in Israeli jails after reaching an agreement with Israeli prison authorities here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, what's your response now to the latest developments today regarding the Israeli prisoners? I couldn't hear the question. Oh, first of all, thank you for joining us here. I want to touch on the uh, development from today as the uh, Palestinian prisoners have given up their hunger strike in Israeli prisons now. Uh, what's your response to that, to the issue that's been uh, mainly a, a very sensitive issue for, for weeks now? Thank you kindly. Uh, well, I guess it has been a very sensitive issue for more than about 63 days. And I guess with the development of the situation by this missing of the three uh, Israeli settlers and then the big uh, invasion of the West Bank and all this uh, destruction that has been carrying on and experimentation on Palestinian civilian people by the Israeli occupation army, I guess the uh, Palestinian administrative prisoners who were carrying on their hunger strike have seen that it might be a possibility for them to negotiate with the Israeli occupation uh, in, in, in jails and see possibilities for a better situation for them. It's not really finished, I think. It's, they hang that up until further notice. Well, as your resident now in Bethlehem in the West Bank, this has been an area that's been experiencing uh, some of the main force of this Israeli security crackdown and, and arrests and searches. Uh, how have you felt this operation? Has it affected the daily life of Palestinians? It's affected every single moment of Palestinian lives. It's affected the life of children and people who are going to schools or universities or work or hospitals and so on. It affected the running of organizations, of civil society organizations which have been attacked and media agencies which have been attacked and uh, archives which has been confiscated, servers and so on. It has also put to nudity the Palestinian Authority uh, facing this Israeli occupation and aggression on Palestinian citizens while they are facing the occupation alone. And the Palestinian Authority could not do anything because of this security coordination that is supposed to protect the occupation but not to protect the Palestinian citizens as far as we see it actually. Well, thank you very much for your time from Bethlehem here. Well, now, dozens of Palestinian prisoners, as we just mentioned, have suspended their hunger strike in Israeli jails after reaching an agreement with the Israeli prison authorities. While well, the strike was launched in late April, the protest controversial administrative detention policies. It's become the longest ever staged by Palestinian detainees. Y24 News correspondent Shahar Pellet has the story. After two months of hunger strikes, scores of Palestinians in Israeli prisons decided to end their protest against detention without trial. Last night, after the occupation met with the representative of the prisoners on hunger strike, they reached an agreement which resulted in their announcing the suspension of their hunger strike and not cancelling it based on achieving some of their demands. About 120 Palestinians on so-called administrative detention began fasting on April 24 and would join 
joined over the past 63 days by 180 others. About 75 needed hospitalization, fueling debate in Israel over a proposed force-feeding law. We staked out the clear policy that brought about this important result, and we will continue now to add additional measures that will ensure there will be fewer prisoner strikes in the future. According to the Israel Prison Service, the prisoners did not receive any significant concessions in order to agree to end the strike, other than that they would not face disciplinary action for the protest. Major assessments for calling off the strike include the expected passing of a law allowing the force feeding of hunger strikers after objecting sides reached an understanding in compromised changes integrated into the bill. Others believe it was the desire to end the protest before the Ramadan fast beginning on Saturday and the abduction of the teenagers which generated dozens of additional arrests that have left out all hope for an end of administrative detention in the near future. Still, some feel their protest marked another step in the Palestinian fight. We are not talking about a big, clear victory in the procedural, practical sense, but we are talking about an improvement in addressing the issue of administrative detention. We are talking about the resistance of a group of prisoners that fought using peaceful resistance. As both sides welcome the agreement that led to an end of the hunger strike, they also remain determined to hold firmly onto their agendas and ideologies. Now, again, we're joined in the studio by Iran Zenger, Middle East editor at IBA. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, now, we've shifted topics a bit to the Palestinian hunger strike that just ended. Uh, what can you update us about? First, nobody really knows um, about this agreement. I mean, we haven't been uh, given yet the full details of this agreement, not from the Israeli side nor the Palestinian side. They, both sides are trying to keep it uh, in secret because they have their reasons. So the Palestinians are trying to sell to their public, to, their, to the Palestinian public, uh, this uh, agreement as a victory, to say, well, we, we want this and time. And not as a cave-in of some kind. No, no, right. but, it, but I, was, I was speaking today with some uh, Palestinian officials and they said to me that because because of the Israeli operation, the Israeli military operation in, in the West Bank after the kidnapping of the three youngsters, and because of what's going on right now in the West Bank, uh, this hunger strike had to end. They had to, they had to put an end to, to it because they understood that nobody is really listening to them. And we have some reasons. Uh, another reason is the fact that um, the uh, holy month of uh, Ramadan, of Muslim, of, of Muslim Ramadan is coming uh, very soon. And there is, they were afraid that it's going, to, um, it's going to hurt their efforts to have an international attention. And when it comes to international attention, nobody is really watching it right now. And this is a very interesting thing right now because um, I was listening to some Israelis who were, who were asking the question, why isn't the world listening to us right now when we are trying to, to address the world uh, for the release of the three youngsters? And the same reason is for the Palestinian um, prisoners. They are being said, or they are being told that because everybody's watching football right now, the world is not busy uh, with, with Israel. Too many uh, other stories uh, stealing the headlines. Iran Zinger, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And now we go live to our correspondent, Eli Ochenberg, who's standing by outside the West Bank city of Hebron. Uh, Eli, great to see you again out there. You've been covering the operations here by the IDF for some 13 days now. What's the latest from Hebron? Well, David, even though the practice and the style of this, oper uh, of this operation had slightly changed, the main mission remained the same. The searching activity continues, and we are now concentrating on the uh, northwestern part of the Hebron area. And just so you will understand the typographical challenges uh, we are dealing with uh, here, we are talking about an area with a lot of mountains and caves, wells, and dried water sources, well, was... hence uh, many uh, possibilities where the three uh, boys uh, might be uh, hidden. And uh, even though the uh, uh, tensions here uh, seems uh, less high, there are still many units working very hard behind the scenes. There's, for an example, there's a, a team of, uh, of uh, special uh, professional strategists who are sitting together in a small room trying to get inside the head of the kidnapper and the, uh, of the kidnappers. And that means they're trying to mimic their previous steps, trying to predict their next step, who, who did they contact uh, with during this uh, last few days, and how how come they Day 13 of the search for the three Israeli teenagers as the IDF arrests 17 Palestinians overnight and Israeli warplanes pound the Gaza Strip in retaliation for rocket fire. 
Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki rejects calls to form a unified government as dozens are killed in a strike reportedly carried out by the Syrian Air Force. And Libyans go to the polls to elect a new national parliament despite the worst violence in the country since 2011. Welcome back to the program. First, some breaking news. According to Lebanese security officials, an explosion now has hit a hotel in central Beirut. Well, preliminary reports indicate that there are casualties at the scene. We'll bring you more updates as they emerge. And now to the daily question. Well, after two months of Palestinian administrative detainees ended their hunger strike, but some say the current situation made the prisoners realize that no one would answer their demands. Well, on today's question, we asked, did the hunger strike by the Palestinian prisoners in Israel serve their cause? Well, joining me is I-24 News correspondent Shahar Pellet. Uh, what were the results of our online survey? Yes, good evening, uh, David. This has always been a case for great debate. We've also heard one of the mothers of the kidnapped boys today saying that she objects the, uh, the, the so-called agreement. And here are the results of uh, our poll. Um, we also see 78% of our viewers say no, this uh, has not, uh, the prisoners have not achieved um, their cause. This hunger strike did not really work. Only 16% saying yes, uh, this is a, um, a right thing to do. And 6% uh, with no opinion. Let's take a look of so at some of the comments we've received. Um, we've got David from France saying uh, the strike ended with no real agreement. The prisoners just caved in because the public's attention was someplace else, their own people terrorist activities. Um, people have taken this uh, um, in a very harsh way uh, and as we know indeed their main goal of uh, uh, avoiding uh, administrative detention wasn't achieved and so many people think this was an, a media stunt and um, their goal hasn't, hasn't, achieved, hasn't been achieved. We've also got Ruth Mendes saying um, what did they get in addition to hurting themselves physically and getting hospitalized? Their goal was to end administrative detention as we said and that didn't really work out for them. Um, we've heard the uh, internal defense minister today, Itzhak Aronovich, saying that there was no official agreement with the Israeli uh, prisoner, prisoner's authority, um, but that many, um, many entities assume they stopped this hunger strike because of the force feeding bill that is upcoming this Monday and will probably uh, pass. And of course, the abduction that has taken shifted the media attention. We also have Meredith who disagrees. She says, no, this proves hunger strikes are a cynical use of media attention and aren't real protests. Another spin of the Palestinians to attract attention. We must uh, mention that uh, more, more than 70 prisoners were hospitalized. These people were indeed uh, under hunger strike, and they took to a serious level. This exactly. wasn't just a few days. Of so, so they they intended to uh, to um, make their call uh, heard and and to cry out uh, what they uh, they wanted to achieve. Um, many say that they did not uh, reach there. We did hear uh, in the report earlier um, the head of the prisoners club. Uh, um, uh, um, Kabir Hussein saying that uh, they uh, they did reach some of the goals. It was successful. Um, let's hear one more objecting. Uh, Tanita from Falsaba saying the hunger strike wasn't effective at all. At the end, the prisoners did not get what they wanted. The disciplinary act continues, and Israel continues to abduct young Palestinians and to hold them without a trial. So, if there are many people we see who objected this hunger strike, there are also those who object uh, Israel's uh, way of detaining Palestinians without a trial, arresting them uh, even though uh, they have done nothing. Well, that's been a popular explanation so far that, yes, the media uh, simply wasn't paying attention. So, these, the hunger strike wasn't uh, getting near to the effect that it was looking for. Exactly. Here. On the other hand, we do have uh, those who believe it was successful. We've got Graham from the UK, for example. He said administrative detention is inhumane. People are imprisoned without any trial. The international community must criticize this severely and help the Palestinians with their cause, meaning that this did actually managed to raise awareness and um, to uh, attract the attention of the international community, which should um, criticize and raise questions regarding this uh, for uh, months, detention. Uh, we held debates here on this program about the topic, so absolutely, it, it did receive some attention in the media. Yes, but many think maybe perhaps not enough. We have, for example, Jeff Darsley from Sydney, Australia. He says, the fact that you are debating it now means it worked. It brought the world's attention to their agenda. Uh, we are talking about this today. And 
and, and for the, the 63 days that these uh, prisoners uh, were protesting. So it does mean something. And also uh, Mary, for example, says it was a useful demonstration because it did raise uh, awareness to the matter. And so even if their specific cause wasn't achieved, they managed to set a more uh, general goal. Uh, many believe that they, um, they managed to uh, uh, not uh, stop this uh, uh, administrative detention because as we've seen in the past two weeks, following the abduction, the Israeli Defense Forces have detained more and more Palestinians trying to find out what happened to the three kidnapped children. But on the other hand, uh, to call for uh, an investigation to see how this way of, on the one hand, um, the, the freedom and on the other hand, the security of the state can go hand in hand. Well, now we're joined by Kobe Sudri on the telephone here, a criminal attorney now. Uh, Mr. Sudri, thanks for joining us again here. Uh, what's your take on the results? Uh, you've been on this program now. Uh, debating this issue in the past. Uh, now, how do you analyze the results of today's agreement? Well, well, first of all, what we can see is the, the proposed bill is much more balanced than the original one. And we should remember that the extreme step of um, force feeding would be uh, implemented only in very special cases that the life of the prisoner of, or of the, the hunger striker are in a real danger. And even then, the force feeding is not automatic. It's subject to a very long legal procedure, which requires a special um, ownership of the, of the attorney general. And then it's subject to a discretion of a district court that will have a, a hearing in which the prisoner will have the opportunity or will have the right to explain to the court why is he on a, on a hunger strike. And the court will try to convince him before he is issuing any warrant against him, will try to convince him to, to feed himself and to stop the, the strike. Only in very, very extreme cases the, the court will issue such a warrant and only then and or even then the doc the doctors who will get such an issue won't be forced to feed well, such Sudri. a prisoner if their conscience prevent them to do so well thank you very much for your contribution <coughs> contribution here kobe sudri and uh shaka pellet again thank you very much for bringing us the story here and and thank you to our viewers for responding to the online poll well we move on now in iraq 57 people were killed from an airstrike in the anbar province reportedly carried out by the syrian air force well, meanwhile, Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki refused to form a unity government in the country. And now U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry will travel to Saudi Arabia on Friday for talks with King Abdullah about the crisis in Iraq. Y24 News reporter Uri Shapira has the latest. Another day of violence and despair gripped Iraq as political disputes continued in Baghdad. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki dismissed the idea of forming a unity government that will include multiple representatives such as Sunnis and Kurds. It is no secret to all Iraqis the dangerous goals behind the call for the formation of a national salvation government, as they call it. It is simply an attempt by those who rebel against the constitution to end the young democratic process and confiscate the opinions of the voters and circumvent the constitutional merits. In the meantime, the Iraqi government is facing new threats at the Western Front. At least 57 people were killed Tuesday and dozens were wounded when warplanes attacked several targets in the Anbar region. According to local officials, the plans were Syrian, but these comments are yet to be confirmed. With no support from the Iraqi military or from the Americans, many of the Iraqis find themselves in the middle of the conflict trying desperately to defend themselves. However, the Shiites in the country form their own armed forces. We are the Sahwa. We are here to protect our land because ISIL is trying to take it. We will keep defending our area and we won't let them advance until we die. However they try to reach our areas, we won't let them. As ISIL continues to wreak havoc in Iraq, Many are deeply concerned by the fast spreading of the Sunni jihadist group. And while Iraqi government is almost completely without control, ISIL are approaching what may be their next stop, Jordan. Well, joining me now from Iraq is I-24 News special envoy to the country, Marie Cartier. Well, thank you for joining us here. Uh, what's the expected response now to Prime Minister Maliki's decision today not to form a unity government? 
Well, this sounds like a provocation to the American diplomacy. Iraqi Prime Minister al-Maliki has rejected call for a national salvation government. He says that such calls are against the Constitution and uh, uh, they are an attempt to end the democratic experience here in Iraq. Um, so you see Maliki, uh, who is very criticized by Sunni and by Kurdish people, uh, seeks only to remain himself in power. Uh, his statement is very far from going in the right direction uh, to find a political issue in Iraq as the United States want to. Well, as reports say the militants are still advancing. What's the latest update from the war on the ground? Well, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria is still gaining ground in the country. The jihadists took control of the most important oil refinery uh, of the country. The oil plant of uh, Beijing provides one-third of the petrol of Iraq. So, therefore, this is a huge spoils of war which may uh, paralyze the whole country. In Baghdad, 130 U.S. advisors are ready to operate today. Uh, they may lead intelligence missions as well as as leading airstrikes operations. And for the first time today, the Iraqi army admitted they were unable to stop ISIS progression on the ground. Well, thank you, Marie Cartier, our special envoy to Iraq. Well, now we continue our focus on Iraqi Kurdistan with a special look at the once thriving and now nearly non-existent Jewish community in the region. Well, again, Marie Cartier, I-24 News special envoy in Iraq, has the story. We are in Kurdistan, an autonomous region in Iraq where all the religious communities live together, near the old citadel of Erbil, the former Jewish neighborhood, the oldest religious community in Iraq. These destroyed houses have been abandoned. They will soon be raised in order to build places for tourists. There will be no sign anymore of the presence of Iraqi Jews in the country, a shame, say some Kurdish citizens. They have the same uh, history. They uh, suffered the same because um, both of them, they lived in countries. They didn't, they are, uh, they were minorities and they didn't have their own uh, country. According to the Iraqi authorities who fought them into exile, there is today no more Jews in the country. However, in northern Iraq, some choose to stay, but it's impossible to approach them. They live hidden and took an Arabic name for fear of being identified. Here, mosques have replaced the synagogues for a long time. Muslim Kurds say they are rather tolerant, but a few months ago a newspaper was being censored and forbidden. This man knows the story very well. He made articles for this magazine. There was a magazine by the name of Israeli Kurds, and this magazine's goal was to create a bridge between the Kurds and the Jews. A short while after, the journal was banned from publication. Kurdistan needs to be an ally of Israel. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki has forbidden Jews to live in Iraq. He urged the Kurdish authorities to do the same here. Since then, they declared that they were no longer able to ensure the security of Jews in Iraqi Kurdistan. And now to a look at the economy. Well, now we're joined by Benjamin Chong Alvarez, the host of our Economy Magazine. Great to see you as Good to always. See you too. Uh, I know the topic of the day here has to do with the French Foreign Ministry and, Indeed. and some things that they've perhaps added to uh, a long standing, uh, I guess, call it a rule in, within their uh, recommendation. Right. I mean, it's sort of a, a somewhat unfortunate timing for the French Foreign Ministry. Um, they basically came out on the website, uh, the French Foreign Ministry website, where they have um, information for travelers uh, saying that, you know, they strongly advise for any French. French citizens not to um, invest in any way, shape, or form in areas that the Palestinian Authority wants for a future state, specifically, of course, dealing with Jewish communities around the West Bank. Um, it's not necessarily a new. It's piece. not at all new. It's not new, and they're not the first to do it. And they made very clear that the timing is is sort of random. You know. I, it so happens that Israeli Foreign Minister, you know, um, Avigdor Lieberman is on, was on his way today to France, to Paris, to meet with his American counterparts and, um, of course, French, um, to discuss uh, the broken down peace process, to discuss the missing uh, teens, 
Um, so the it, timing certainly does seem significant. Again, you have yes, 10,000 Israeli troops combing the entire West Bank right. without looking for these teens. Right, right, right. But I'm not going into the political side of things. Frankly, I really want to just focus on this specifically right now. I mean, in Europe itself, it's not special. Um, Great Britain came out with the same, a similar kind of, of warning against its citizens to be very careful because, after all, these areas are considered to be illegal or illegally occupied, according to world, uh, law, you know, general global law, international law. Um, and so it, they're not legally binding, which is also what specifically the French came out to say afterwards, saying, you know, we're not putting out this statement to, to really put down the law, so to speak. We're just telling people to be careful because, after all, you know, you never know what's going to happen with your investment. Well, of course, immediately what's afterwards... What's the potential impact here on the Israeli economy based on these recommendations? So, truthfully, I mean, there's no real direct impact. Um, it's kind of a non-story. It's really more of a political statement saying, you know, just so you know, this is where we're holding. You know, it d doesn't have actual political or economic uh, impact on any level. Plus, it discourages, uh, I suppose, investment of some kind or prohibits the investment. The people who would actually go there for investment probably wouldn't necessarily look at the French Foreign Ministry website to say, oh, wait a minute, oh my gosh, I can't invest there because it's illegally occupied. It brings to mind the, the story of SodaStream that we dealt with Indeed. recently around the Super Bowl. Which actually takes me to another point, and that is specifically that, um, you know, the world, a lot of people in the world who have not been here look Look at um, the territories, look at the West Bank, whatever you want to call it, Judah and Shamran, and they say, well, look, you know, here these people are, are occupied and these people can't work. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of, there's a lot of, of actual, you know, coexistence between Arabs and Jews living in this area. And as we saw in SodaStream, um, really there's, there's a, a lot of Arabs that live in the area that work in SodaStream. Um, specifically, there's about 22,000 um, Arab workers that go and work in these, uh, in these Jewish settlements as well. So it's not such a simple story of let's just divide and be done with it. Um, everybody is, depends on everybody else in this area. Well, thank you very much. Benjamin chong is the host of our Economy Magazine. Great to have you as always. Thank you. And now moving on to another story that we've been following in Libya. Citizens are casting their ballots today in the vote for a new parliament, hoping that it will ease the turmoil that's gripped the country. Well, latest weeks here have seen the worst violence in the country since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi three years ago. Y24 News reporter Gabriela Weiniger has the story. The fight for a new Libya is underway. The vote marks another step forward in its transition after decades of one-man rule. The new parliament will replace the General National Congress, which has become deadlocked over internal disputes between Islamist members and their opponents. The next parliament must take into account Libyans' feelings and serve Libyans not like the General National Congress. They forgot about the Libyan people and their feelings. The North African country has been slipping deeper into turmoil after a former army general launched a campaign against Islamist militants in the east. On election day, we are eager to ensure that everything goes well, and accordingly, the government have requested a ceasefire from us. As such, we are decreasing the intensity of our operations to give these elections a chance. Libya seems to be craving a functioning government and parliament, but many fear the vote will produce just another interim assembly. A special body to draft a new constitution has still not finished its work raising questions over what kind of political system the country will eventually adopt. The time when we are choosing a parliament is a sensitive time. It's a critical time. It's a time for Ramadan. And the fights in Benghazi and what's going on in Darna, all of this is going to affect and sabotage and corrupt the electoral process. The challenge is not just holding an election amid security concerns. The success of the vote may depend on whether influential players in the country will accept its results. And now we take a look at sports. Well, I'm joined in the studio by Jonathan Regev, the host of our sports magazine. Great to have you. Hi, David. Thank you for having me. Well, of course, the topic at hand here, World Cup. Tell us what's going on now and what's at stake. Yes, you know, these last couple of days, every time I'm sitting here and I'm watching, watching there because we have the screen. The game between Argentina and Nigeria is, is in stoppage time, about, about to end. Argentina is winning 3-2. 
you know what, as long as it's like this, it's not really important whether Argentina wins or there's a, a, a draw. Argentina will be first in this group, Nigeria second. And that is because the other game, uh, the, the result is 3-1 for Bosnia against Iran. So even if there's a, both games in stoppage time, even if there's a slight change, this group is practically decided. Argentina is going to be first, Nigeria is going to be second, and they advance to the second round. They will look ahead to the action coming up in Group E tonight. France will face Ecuador. That game is in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, Honduras will play against Switzerland. That game is in Manaus. Uh, group F will meet up with Group E at the, at the second round. So obviously um, um, the, the teams that are playing now will take a look later. France are they're assured of a, a spot in the second round. Practically, practically assured of a first spot as well, which means they will face probably Nigeria. And uh, Ecuador and Switzerland fighting for second place. Ecuador is currently second, but it's on goal difference, so everything can change tonight. Uh, well, let's talk about the other uh, thing that's caught the attention of the world here surrounding the tournament now. Uh, Uruguay's star, Luis Suarez, I guess everyone knows by now, accused of biting an opponent. Yeah, Uruguay beat Italy 1-0. Big drama, big game. Uruguay are through, Italy are home, and nobody speaks about this. What do people speak about? This, the biting. What was Luis Suarez thinking? He beat um, a Italian uh, um, uh, defender, Chiellini, uh, in his shoulder. The referee did not see it at the moment, so uh, um, Suarez was um, allowed to stay in the pitch. And Suarez but, played it off as if he maybe hit his yeah, hand on his and, shoulder. Yeah, and, and then he said, well, you know, these things happen in football. These things happen in football when Luis Suarez is on. They don't really happen in football with other players. Um, but so, so, yeah, the referee did not see it, and, and he kept on playing, but there are cameras everywhere. You cannot run away from that. Why are we saying, why am I saying this happens when Luis Suarez is on? This is not the first time, this is not even the second time when he's involved in a biting affair. This is the third time. It happened once in Liverpool about um, a bit over a year ago. He, he, he beat a Chelsea player in the shoulder. And again, the, the, that image was not seen by the referee at the time. He, he, he stayed on the pitch. He scored the equalizer for Liverpool late in stoppage time. But cameras were there. They caught him. He was suspended for 10 games. By the, F, by the English FA, uh, another incident in the Netherlands back in 2010. He was playing for Ajax. He beat an Eindhoven player three times already. Now, uh, uh, the FIFA disciplinary board will be meeting in, in the next couple, or the, the next few days. They're talking about overstepping the, essentially what they say that the referees missed. Uh, they can now enforce discipline on him, right? Absolutely. This is what happened in England. He kept on playing for Liverpool in that game, but then he was suspended for 10 games. 10 games. Now FIFA, uh, FIFA will have to decide uh, what to do. Uruguay's next game is uh, the, the uh, round of 16 against Colombia. That game is on uh, Saturday. A decision has to be taken before that game. My guess is that FIFA has to act. There's, if it weren't Luis Suarez, then we'd say, you know what? If it happens once, we can say it, it's a mistake. If it happens twice, we can say it's a coincidence. Three times, that's a habit. And we saw the memes in the internet, just the, the fans going wild. So many so many c cartoons, memes of, of Luis Suarez coming on. They depict him as, as, as star. Jaws, as, as, as a biting dog, you name it. But uh, you know what? He brought it uh, upon himself. And you know what? At the end of the match last night, you saw he realized something went wrong because he left the pitch all by himself. He knew something was wrong. Not even the teammates. The, he, was the, he was the hero against England. All the teammates congratulated him. Not this time. He was left alone. He knew he did something wrong. All his teammates knew he, was, he did something wrong. And he will probably, we cannot know for sure yet, probably be given a, a long suspension by uh, FIFA, which means he'll be out for the World Cup and, and years to come. And we, we know that Argentina has now officially won their match. Uh, again, thank three, you very much. 3-2, and they're first in Group E. Group moving F. on, moving on. Jonathan Regev, thanks as always. Thank you, David. And we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after a short break.